Okay, we are indeed. Well, welcome everyone to this week's episode of Weekly Hope. I'm Kirsten Hagland, and it's a joy to be with you. Thank you so much for joining us this Wednesday evening. Um, as many of you know, this is our third, fourth official episode, actually. So we're really glad for those of you who are returning. And um, I always bring in my co-host at the very top of the show to welcome you all to, and that is Miss Elsa. She's my toy poodle. Um, she's right here. <laughs> And she says hello to everyone. Oh, she's like, I'm not camera ready. <laughs> but she says hello and welcome to Weekly Hope to all of you. Uh, greetings from Switzerland. I live in Zurich, Switzerland, um, but we broadcast obviously live all over the world. And um, we've been really, really excited too as you comment and post and say, um, hello to us as we are live and even afterward um, we are getting people signing in from all over the world so this is really really exciting um, not only from the United Pastor, States. Pastor be quiet I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> That's our guest's son. Yeah yeah my son is uh, walking through the kitchen eating chips. Oh cool well you can join us if he wants as well. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I just wanted to say welcome to, to everyone from wherever you're joining us from. Uh, just want to say hello and thank you. And as well, uh, this is an opportunity for you to share your voice, to share your story, of course, to ask questions. So please, as you watch, say hello, let us know where you're signing in from and anything, of course, that is on your mind. As you can tell, this is a very informal conversation. Um, so we want to hear from you. Without further ado then, I wanna welcome this week's guest who is an incredible woman and has become a dear friend over the last several years. And I'm very, very excited to welcome her. She's the founder and CEO of Finding Balance, which we are gonna hear all about. So please give a warm welcome to Constance Rhodes. Constance. Hey everybody. <laughs> welcome, welcome. And you're in Nashville, Tennessee, or Franklin, Tennessee, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so that's where you're joining us from. Um, so first of all, I, a huge thank you to you for joining us because for those who don't know, we promoted on our Eating Disorder Hope um, Facebook and Twitter um, all this past weekend that the Hungry for Hope conference was going on. And that is, of course, a huge project that you have put together. How many years now have you been putting together the Hungry for Hope conference? So, so last week was the 10th anniversary. It was actually started by our mutual friend, Travis Stewart. And then we took it over in 2009, I think, and then have continued it on since then. So it's been a while. Wow. Congratulations. 10 years. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, you, you probably feel like it feels like 20 because putting on a project like that is absolutely a huge amount of effort, which is why, again, we're very thankful that you're taking the time to join us. Um, and actually, Travis was the very first guest on our show on Weekly Hope. Okay. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, he is incredible. So um, so why don't you give our viewers, oh, and just want to say hello to Sarah joining us from Australia and Samantha, who's back. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so why don't you fill in um, our viewers on Hungry for Hope, what it is, why you started it, and... Um, maybe if people want to go next year, what they can expect. Yeah, so so Hungry for Hope is a faith-based summit for eating disorders. Um, we have both community and clinical tracks. So we're kind of doing a lot of things within the same space. We are wanting to help provide solid information, encouragement, and inspiration to people who are on a recovery path. And we want to help equip clinicians uh, with, with more tools for the work they're doing with those with eating disorders, um, particularly if they're interested in some of the faith-based components. Not everything is about that, but that's maybe one of the things that is unique about our event. And then another kind of unique aspect to it, you know, we're here in Music City, so we do love to bring the arts into it, have recording artists, worship leaders, um, do a number of creative workshops and things like that, because we love reawakening creativity and dreams in people's hearts. We think that that's a key part of having incentive to keep moving forward. And so that's always another feature of, of what we do at this event. Yeah. And, you know, I had, I've had the great thrill and honor of being able to speak at a Hungry for Hope conference a couple of years ago. And my parents attended this one this year, even though I couldn't mm -hmm. be there. And I've been multiple times and I just 
will tell everyone, if you live in the United States, and you, even if you don't, but if you live in the US and you have an opportunity to go um, to this conference, it is unlike anything you'll ever do. It's not just where you sit there and it's just dry information and you have to try to keep yourself awake in a freezing hotel room. It's in a really, really, <laughs> or hotel ballroom. Um, it's in a really, really cool, funky, creative space. Um, everyone there is warm and welcoming and non-judgmental. Uh, the music is incredible and inspiring. And you just really feel like even the therapists and counselors who come who work in this space, I always feel like it's an opportunity for them to be real and let go and relax and receive encouragement if they've gotten, you know, burned out or stressed or, or whatever it may be, because we're all people, right, at the end of the day, and we all need to be poured into. And it's just, it's like therapy itself. Um, <laughs> so if you have the opportunity, um, definitely check out Hungry for Hope Conference. And again, congratulations on a really, really successful event. Yeah, you know, your mom and dad were so sweet, you know, because we ended with a gala on Saturday night. And, and did you know, I don't know if you know, know, but they got up on the stage, they had a little brief moment there. And so even though you weren't there in person, Kirsten, we still felt your presence through your lovely parents. But well, I, that, I really do appreciate that. And of course, for those of you who don't know as well, I have um, <clears throat> with, I mean, it's largely been a family effort, a foundation which tries to raise funds to support people in treatment. And we have loved um, working with Finding Balance and helping support women in their Lasting Freedom program. Um, and so my parents, I think I think my mom, she texted me in the morning, was like, what should I say? <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, you'll be fine. Just, you don't need to, me to tell you what to say. Um, they did awesome. <laughs> but, um, but speaking of that, so um, also let us know a little bit about Finding Balance, uh, which is an incredible resource as well. Um, if people, because you do uh, a lot with online support programs. So let people know a little bit about what Finding Balance does. Sure, yeah. So when I started Finding Balance, I was, you know, just coming out of my own eating disorder. You know, a lot of us that work in the field have that experience. And for me, a lot of the years that I was wrestling with food issues, I did not have what's called a cl more clinical eating disorder, you know, so maybe I wasn't meeting all the criteria for certain types of eating disorders. And as I was beginning to find freedom in my own life, I really felt compelled that there were a lot of people who needed support who maybe, um, you know, they, they just weren't meeting that clinical criteria. So they either thought this isn't a big enough issue, or maybe sometimes even their counselors thought maybe this isn't a big enough issue. Is this really a life controlling issue? And, and they needed a place to go to, to be able to learn, hey, when is this out of balance? You know, and how can I find support? And what do I actually need recovery wise? Because a lot of people, as you know, Kirsten, they swing from one side of disordered eating to another, right? So 16 years ago, almost 17 years ago, we started just spreading that message. Like, hey, you don't have to meet all criteria to have an issue worth addressing. What is, you know, how do we know if these issues are out of alignment? And then what can we do to help work on them? And then about almost five years ago, we started what has become really our most important work we do called the Lasting Freedom online support program. This is the one that, of course, your foundation helps fund scholarships for. And the idea is that, you know, you've got people all over the world, and we've served people all over the world with food issues who either because of expense or where they are located can't find quality help or, it, or ongoing support. And so we created this program called Lasting Freedom. And the way that it works is people click into a group that they will then walk with through different modules. We now have six modules. So if someone goes through the whole program, they're with us for about a year and they're meeting people and connecting with others, but in a very safe and moderated and structured environment. So that's the most important work we do. That's Lasting Freedom. Then we have the summit, which you've already mentioned. And then a new tool that we are piloting now and hope to roll out to a lot of different places is um, a, a curriculum for small groups. Um, that one's called Christ Fed. It's specifically for church folks. Um, I know not everyone that we serve wants, you know, faith-based stuff, but a lot of them do. So we've got that tool. And so just continuing to create bridges for people so that whether they're get, they need to go into treatment, they're coming out of treatment, or maybe they don't need full treatment, but they need support and direction, we're able to meet them where they're at. That's really, really incredible. And actually, I want to uh, dive a little bit into 
what you mentioned about your own experience and that being that you didn't necessarily maybe fit, you know, at the time that you were struggling, which so much has changed obviously now in, in the field as well and continues to change, I think for the better, um, for the most part, uh, but about not meeting certain clinical criteria and then the self doubts that come with anyone who struggles, um, yeah. no matter how severely, really from a diagnostic perspective, the self doubt of I'm not sick enough, um, mm -hmm. or because I don't meet a certain checklist, then I must not be worthy of treatment. This must not be that bad. Um, how did you overcome that to get the help? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I remember going to a counselor and, and it was the first counselor I saw and, uh, I laid out to her. It was the first time I realized, and I encourage anyone listening to consider this. It was the first time I laid out. Uh, when it began for me and then bringing to present date at that time and, and I was shocked to discover it had been 10 years mm -hmm. and when I did that and I kind of laid out to her all of the food rules I had all of the fears that I had related to you know if my clothes don't fit exactly right or I always think I need to be a size smaller the next time I shop like all this stuff that I laid out I'll never forget that she looked at me and she was just like I really don't see how this is different than most people live. I mean, she really did say that because the truth is we know this, right? Everyone's consumed with the body and the shape of the body and wanting to work out and wanting to be fit and wanting to eat right. And, and in her view, and you're right, the field has come a long way. I mean, this was almost 20 years ago. In her view, I wasn't sick. I wasn't severely underweight. I wasn't severely overweight. I had a job, I was married, what's the big deal? And so, you know, for many years, what that allowed me to do was live in denial of how consumed I was with food and weight. So as I began to work through it, though, uh, for me, it was a very humbling moment to just be able to admit, hey, I am completely consumed by this. Like, my whole life revolves around what did I eat and what do I weigh? And, and when I could finally admit that to myself, hey, I, you know, maybe I'm not meeting all these criteria, but this is an issue that matters for me. For me, my faith was important. I really felt like, you know, there's this God that wants me to not live consumed by something, and I can either choose to just try to keep forcing life my way um, and saying this isn't really an issue, or I could choose to admit, you know, that, hey, maybe something's going on. Because the truth was, there were different things that were going on for me that were evidence of the fact that my obsession with food was not healthy. Yeah. Did you eventually find a treatment team that was educated enough to be able to see what was happening? And do you think that, that generally that situation is, has improved, that there are more clinicians out there who now could recognize that list of food rules and rituals and whatever it was and say, yeah, this is not healthy. Where are we on the spectrum of improvement? So far. Well, I don't know the, the, the statistical answer for that, but what I would say is I think you're right that things have improved, and I think still that a lot of very well-intended folks working in health and fitness fields are unaware of triggers like, hey, you should only eat these foods, or hey, let's make sure we get you to that weight. So I think there's still, even though there's been a huge swing toward body positivity, health at every size, and all these different things, I think there still is a lot of confusion out there among the wellness community um, that can propel, perpetuate these disordered behaviors. Because unless you step back and look at, you know, hey, if somebody is eating, you know, by all of these rules, they're also maybe not going out with their friends, maybe, you know, paranoid about having eaten the wrong thing and now their anxiety is high. Unless somebody's looking at those components, you could look at someone who's especially in the clean eating thing, which is very popular right now. You could look at that and think, hey, we're doing better than ever. But you want to take that deeper look, as you know, into, but at what cost? And one of the interesting things that came up in our Hungry for Hope Summit last week, one of our presenters, Kelly Needham, pulled out a Time Magazine article, and I won't remember the name of it, uh, but that researcher had discovered that she had clients who ate so good and so clean, and they were experiencing health difficulties. Meanwhile, she had clients who were maybe not eating so great, and they, they, some of them did not have health difficulties, and she began to look at it and just realize, let's make sure we're looking at the emotional components of how we relate with food, because sometimes, a lot of times those emotional components can have just as much of a health impact as the actual nutritive value of what we're putting in our bodies.
Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's so, so true. I mean, it's, I hesitate to use the word psychosomatic because it's probably not the right use of it, but the fact that all health is connected, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical well-being is all connected. Um, and actually, if you are listening and you're more interested in the clean eating aspect of that they were talking about, we had um, Jessica Setnick on a couple episodes ago and she talked about orthorexia specifically. We did a whole episode on orthorexia. So if you go back on our videos on Facebook page, as well as our YouTube channel, you can see um, the whole video there on orthorexia, which is really, really enlightening. Um, yes, good. But, um, and speaking of that, you know, if there's people who are listening and they say, yeah, Constance, I'm totally on board with you on this. I don't necessarily look like what the public perceives an eating disorder should look like, or I'm not being validated by my therapists or a dietitian, et cetera. You know, what encouragement can can you give them? What can they do in that moment? Because it's a really, especially if you get to the place where you're finally like, I want to get better rather than being in that place of denial, where does that person go? What do they do? Yeah. Well, so the first thing I'd say is keep fighting. Cause I mean, it's your life and no one's going to care about it as much as you do sometimes. So you want to just keep, keep going. And if you know that something's going on and you know that it's life controlling and people don't seem to take that seriously, that just means they're not quite your right fit yet for a counselor or maybe nutritionist. So keep, keep looking. Uh, you know, we do have some resources at our site. Uh, to directly connect you with us and get talking with someone, you can go to findabalance.com. You can even take some self-tests. You can find them right on the homepage just to see, you know, oh, hey, my trend is binging or my trend is restricting or my trend is orthorexia, to use that word that you were just using. So, you know, look at things like that and then reach out. Like if you reach out to us, um, we can help you process through some of that, help point you in some of the right direction. And there's other resources I know that, eating disorder hope you guys have a lot of resources as well you want to go to folks that really do understand eating issues and be just be aware that not everyone does it is a specialty and so if this is an area that you're wrestling with and you feel like you're not being heard keep pounding on another door until you find someone who will um who that resonates with because then you know you're not weird i think there's so much to just being able to feel validated and not only, you know, not only am I not weird for thinking this is an issue, because it is, but there's, there's legit reasons that I ended up in this place, and there's hope for me to walk out. And when you know all of those things, I think that makes it so much easier to go ahead and do some of the hard work of going ahead and, you know, looking at what's gotten you there, looking at where you want to go, and then being guided along that way. So just, you know, don't isolate. I, you know person, um, you know, that, that tendency to think, oh, I, I'm terminally unique, to use a word that one of my people says, I'm the only one who, you know, can't get well, or I can maintain this really unhealthy lifestyle and be happy, you know, all that. But if you're unhappy, and you're lonely, and you're obsessed, and you're consumed, and you're constantly thinking about this, there really is a lot more to life than that. And we just really encourage you to go chase it, like go chase it wherever you can. Yeah, I love I love that. I love how and and you in so much of your materials and in the lasting freedom program, it's a part of the name. Um, you talk about freedom um, rather than and you know, recovery is a great word because it. I mean, everyone uses it, but someone pointed out and I forget who it was. It's horrible, but <laughs> that we're not recovering to our former self. We're discovering. <laughs> And, you know, in, at the risk of being super cheesy here and the way I'm talking about that, but discovering like a new person and finding freedom. Um, and, you know, and this, I'm just, I'm just really interested in your perspective as well. Uh, you know, I've heard, and I think so many people have heard different views on, can you be totally free from an eating disorder or is this something you struggle with for the rest of your life? I think it's probably one of the biggest misconceptions too from people on the outside that think that it's something people struggle, you know, they're just going to have it for the rest of their life. What is your view and perspective on that concept? Yeah. So what I would say is, so I don't live with an eating disorder today and I haven't for many years. Um, now I will just say for myself, could I have the propensity to be tempted in that direction again, if life got hard, I would say, yeah, I could have that propensity because that was a tool I used in the past to make me feel safe, right? So for me, I like to stay aware of the fact 
that, that I might find myself tempted in that direction. But see, what I have around me in my life now is so much accountability and people who know me, and, and I, I don't see that happening, um, but I've got accountability and things in place. So I, I guess the way that I look at it is, you know, once we think we're invincible, I think that's when we're most likely to fall. So for me to be aware of, hey, this is an area, a tool, like I said, a tool I used, because I don't know if everybody thinks about it that way, but, you know, these issues and these addictions are tools we use to help us feel safe or to help us feel numb or, you know, to deal with life, right? And so unless we're establishing new tools, uh, we can find ourselves tempted back in that direction. The key is to continually be moving forward. And then I think another key thing is just because there's this whole issue of relapse, right? Oh, I, you know, I, I, I made a mistake and now I'm going to fall back into everything. See, that's not true either. That's back to that black and white thinking. Could I feel tempted, me individually as a person, feel tempted to want to do some of those behaviors again? Yes. If I ever did dip my toe in that, does that mean I'm all the way there again? No, but do I have the right kind of support and accountability around me to hopefully keep me from dipping my toe, or if I do dip my toe, pull me back? And so I, I don't know how that jives with your you know, own personal view of it, but I think there's something very humbling about that um, and, and good to be able to say, you know what, I'm, I am just as weak as the next person sometimes, and I got to have the right structure around me to make sure that I wouldn't go in that direction. Yeah, I am very, I very much connect with a lot of what you said. And one way that I thought about it too, is I think at the very beginning, um, of my recovery journey, I was absolutely terrified of relapse because you hear so much about it and you hear that it's completely inevitable. And I think that can be, I mean, I think it's really good to have realistic thinking, but at the same time, not be dispirited and what yeah. you just talked about. Um, and I would start to think like if I was having a bad day or if I was having, and not bad regarding behaviors, but just not feeling like I'm so happy with my life all day long, right? Yeah. Or if I had a day where like, I didn't love the way my body felt, right? And I've always been a dancer, so just very in tune with how everything internally is feeling, right? Well, eating disorder can relate to that. Um, and if so, if I wasn't feeling like I felt in my best day in recovery, then, oh my gosh, am I starting to, to relapse? And it was like, no. Um, and it took to talking to a lot of clinicians as well as my own treatment team or, you know, therapists. And, and I've continued to go, to go to therapy in my life for other things, or if I'm going into a hard season and not been afraid of that um, and realize that that's just life. Yeah. That's just life. You know, and just because you're recovered from an eating disorder doesn't mean you're not going to have bad days or anxiety or come into seasons of your life where different things are a struggle. Um, and also, I, too, have that radar that goes on in the back of my brain that go, OK, that's the kind of thinking that leads back down that road. And I think that so I think one of the great things about therapy, especially early therapy, when you're discovering all those things, discovering the triggers and learning about yourself, is that you learn where those soft spots are or where those triggers may be. And so you can, you just, you learn by practice, right? You just learn by identifying them all the time or the emotional areas where you go mm -hmm. and just learning that when the red flags go up, that's where they are and that you can be free from eating disorder behaviors, but you're going to have bad days and you're going to have challenging seasons. Um, yeah. And give yourself grace. Like, give yeah. yourself grace. Um, yeah. Nobody's holding you to the level of accountability that you're likely going to hold yourself. Right. So, yeah, yeah, there's room. There's room for grace and all of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and speaking of grace, um, the last uh, thing that I wanted to talk with you about, because it's such a big part of lasting freedom, of finding balance, and of your own story, and that is the faith component. And again, you've given the disclaimer, and I will as well, and that's that, you know, if you're someone who is not a person of faith, or you come from, you know, a different faith background, um, you know, this is a, an, a, an inclusive conversation, but faith is a big part of a lot of people's lives and a lot of people's journey. And, um, you know, people who overcome, whether it's an addiction or um, another co-occurring disorder or an eating disorder, um, spirituality can be a big part of the healing process for them. Um, I know it was for me personally, and I, and I know Constance mentioned for her as well. But I want to talk specifically about, you know, the pain that can come from being hurt mm -hmm. in the faith community by, a, by your church, by um, members of your, you know, religious community, um, you know, by your synagogue, by 
um, the people in, you know, whatever faith community that you belong to, mm -hmm. we can be hurt and religion can be used as a tool to control, manipulate, um, and be very, very disruptive. So Constance, I'd love to get your thoughts kind of on how that can be turned around, how that can be healed, how grace can be redeemed mm -hmm. and a faith walk can be redeemed even if someone has been really, really hurt by their faith community. Yeah, so, so the first thing there is, is to reinforce what you just said, which is that if you're listening to this and you have been hurt in a faith tradition or community, you're not alone. Um, if you think about it, these communities are made up of people like us, right? And so we, we all, uh, all of us, just humans, you know, we have been known to hurt each other, right? And so you have well-intended people who try to, um, they overlay a faith tradition and mental health in particular and recovery kinds of things has been largely misunderstood by the church. I would say the church at large. And there have been messages such as, if you love God more, you won't have these problems. Or, God is mad at you because you have these problems. These are messages that, that are sometimes heard and felt. Um, but as far as how to overcome that, what I would say, first of all, is that, you know, I do believe that there is a God who created us. And he knows what you've been through. And he's, I, I believe he is not angry or threatened by, by the fact that you might you know, be a little gun shy about the faith piece. And so what I would say is if that's something that's important to you, um, to have a spirituality and some kind of sense that, that there is a God that is walking with you through this, just start with wherever you are and know that, man, he so loves you and he's with you anyway. I believe that. And he's just kind of everywhere. He is with you and he can lead you to the kind of support that can repair some of those wounds. We see that a lot. You know, last week at our summit, I had someone tell me uh, afterward that that had been the story for her. There had been wounding through that and she had to take a break from church, from anything kind of more spiritual. And, you know, as a result of the weekend that was stirred around in her and now now, perhaps uh, God will lead her into a different level of that. So, so first is remove that shame. Man, if stuff happened to you, that is not your fault. And then I just encourage you, okay, if there's a God out there, <laughs> and if you care about me, show me, you know, show me what is really true. And the truth is that you are loved, and he is never going to leave us for stuff we do wrong. He's just not going to do it. So... Uh, you know, it's obviously a much deeper topic, but feel validated that if that has happened to you, um, that's a true thing. That's a legit thing. And there is hope for you to be able to, to discover a different relationship with maybe a different God than you've been introduced to before. Yeah, I think that it's so good. And I think we confuse oftentimes the way that people have hurt us, um, broken people, uh, whether it's people in our family or friends or in our faith community. Um, and they're just people who are broken like us. Uh, and also another thing you said about like, God can handle it. And um, mm -hmm. I just encourage people like, if you've never prayed or meditated before, like taking quiet time, um, it's like, it doesn't have to be like a memorized prayer or a certain mantra that you found online or like just, I mean, God can take your anger, <laughs> you know, like if you feel hurt, if you feel betrayed, if you feel like there has been injustice done to you or someone that you love, um, express it. And also that that's like a huge part of therapy and like acknowledging your emotions anyway. So if, you know, if that is something that's important to you, take it to God. Like he can deal with all of that complexity mm -hmm. of emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I just, that was really, really hugely important to me um, in, in my own personal recovery journey. And I think it's important to, because as you said, like he sees everything anyway. So it's like, it's important not to hide. Yeah. Yeah, just to invite him into it, you know, the, our favorite verse that we use in our work here, again, we are a faith-based org, but it is Galatians 5.1. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. But the second part of it is like, stand firm. Don't submit again to slavery. And, you know, a lot of us 
we submit to slavery in all these different ways, whether it's what does so-and-so think of me or how much do I weigh or, you know, we just submit to slavery, but we don't have to. We can stand firm. And part of that standing firm is just being honest with God and everyone <laughs> about what we're wrestling with, what we're scared about, what we need to see happen. And uh, I just think he shows up. I think God shows up when we ask him to. I mean, he's there all the time. But, you know, if we're not looking for him, we might miss the signs of him moving around in our lives. He really does want us to be free. There's so much more life that he created us to live. So, yeah. so yeah, that's what we get excited about at um, Lasting Freedom. Like, let's keep pushing toward what else is there <laughs> besides this, yeah. you know. There's a bigger thing out there that, um, that we were created for than this. So let's go find it. Yeah, totally. I just want to acknowledge some of the comments here. We got a, an amen from Amy. Um, Gina, Gina says she's so thankful to be able to slip away from the kids and not miss this. So thanks, Gina. Um, also, Sarah had, had said this earlier when we were talking about clinicians. Sarah said some health professionals just really don't see what is really going on and it makes it hard when you're trying to get help. And that's so true. And I hope, Sarah, that you felt validated too by this conversation. Um, and so we're getting a lot of amens, which is really nice. Um, but it's about the message. Uh, and, and then just furthermore, I wanted to uh, piggyback on what you were saying about grace um, and about being real with God and with others. And it brings me to the thought of others. And I just want to encourage, because I've been hurt by church people um, very recently, actually. And um, wherever you are, if you find out, and I hate to say your truth because that sounds so like, I don't know, just like find your truth. It just sounds so wishy-washy. Um, but if you have done serious work and found where you can stand firm mm -hmm. and you're in a toxic environment, leave. Yes. It is not worth it to stay um, for your own health. For others um, it's just not and I think it takes a lot of wisdom to discern what environments you can help to change or improve or offer your voice and your experience but if you're not getting a response there takes it there's a certain time when you have to go and be where it's healthy for you to be and I think for a lot for especially the there are those of us who've grown up like following the rules um, and trying to be a good, whatever it is, parishioner or student or wife or friend or whatever, um, that it can be hard to do that. But I promise you, it is so, so incredibly freeing. And go find the people who you can influence for the good um, and stop throwing your pearls before swine. Yeah. Sorry, that's a really, that might be a really, really forward thing to say, but that that is so important. It really is because you're right. There are some minds that we will never change, and we must we must decide. Um, you know, is this where I'm supposed to be or not? I had to get out of the music business, for example. Christian music industry for me at the time of my eating disorder was a triggering environment. Wasn't their fault per se. Now. Were there some image oriented things that I wish were different? Yes, but I needed to get out. I couldn't, I just couldn't be there and be healthy. And I think that's what you're talking about. If you're somewhere and you can't be healthy, you can't be you and it's a toxic environment, just go like go somewhere else. And you can come, it doesn't mean you can never come back to that environment. I could probably work in the music business today and I'd be fine, but there could be a season where you've just got to go be you. <laughs> Yeah. Amen, sister. Um, just want to get to a question here from Cynthia. She talks about her daughter who is, um, she still struggles with people who believe that her eating disorder is imaginary. Um, and she, uh, she's in, she's in, a, in therapy at an amazing place called Juno house in Calgary. Um, she has a grip on what her triggers are. This will keep her safer as she becomes fully independent. But she says, as a mom, I'll always worry about her slipping. And that's, probably a really great opportunity for you to say, how can you encourage parents, especially moms? Yeah. Well, and I think part of that pressure, and I'm a parent as well, is the feeling that we've got to keep our kids on the right track. And that's kind of overwhelming pressure. So I'll start with that. I mean, even in looking at my own 
children's struggles. Um, that's again why I like to think there's a God <laughs> who's bigger than I am. So the first thing is to just be aware that, you know, there are things that you can control in your daughter's life and there are things you can't. And I know it's hard, but somehow having the grace to, um, to not carry the burden of making sure she doesn't mess up, that'd be one thing. And secondly, uh, anything that you can do to continually express love and care and compassion and acceptance so that she knows that even if she does mess up, you're a safe person to come to. That'll keep those lines of communication open. And I think that's super important as well. And third, I would just say, uh, you know, getting in some kind of support. We serve tons of people from Canada, actually, but getting in some kind of support for her uh, that's ongoing so that you know that she's got, she, you know, because sometimes when you're in treatment, you then you get out and you're kind of trying to find your way. So anything you can do to help her find uh, a good group of folks to be plugged in with, I think that would be another gift to her as well. Awesome. Such, such good advice. That's always the one I, I can't give <laughs> any really insight into because I'm not, I'm not a parent and I just know from my mom's experience what super, super valuable perspective. Um, we have lots of people um, commenting and, and signing on today. So thank you guys so, so much. Um, we're going to let Constance go. We could talk with her all day and we'll probably would absolutely love to have you back on the show as well. Um, but before we let everyone go here, why don't you give us um, one last way that people can find you and find New balance and the lasting freedom program. How can they connect with you if this was, you know, something they're really interested in? Yeah, well, and we didn't mention, I did write a book. It was a really long time ago, but it's called Life Inside the Thin Cage. And so if you're interested in my story, you could read that. There's some good uh, tools and practical things that I learned in that. But findingbalance.com is our site. And if you get to our site right there on the homepage, you'll see you can take our eating issue self-test and you can learn more about lasting freedom. And then you can also look at our faith-based provider network. So that's another thing that you could look into. And uh, so right there, hopefully you find it right on the homepage. You can find at least a few different ways to connect with us. And we would love to journey with you if that's something that you need support. Um, just, just reach out to us and we'll walk that road with you. Awesome. So findingbalance.com is the website. And of course you're on social, Twitter, Facebook as well. Um, such a wonderful resource. And as you can tell, it's all run by Constance and so much of the spirit and the like the milieu of things comes from the top down and just knowing Constance for the years that I've known her she's an incredible woman and everything she does is infused with love and that grace that we talked about and just being authentic and real which is I think we all need more of in our life so Constance you rock thank you again so much hot off the heels of your conference for taking the time to be with all of us, share your story and share your inspiration. Thank you so much. Definitely my pleasure. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you everyone for being here again. Thanks for your comments and questions. Um, please, you can obviously go ahead and share this video. It's gonna be pinned to the top of the Eating Disorder Hope Facebook page for the whole week until our episode next week, next Wednesday, back here at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, Samantha says, thank you. Thank you, Sam. It's great to see you every week. And of course, Elsa says goodbye and wishes you a very, very happy week. And I um, hope you all have a beautiful, blessed Wednesday evening and a wonderful week. Enjoy and be thankful for each and every day that you're given because I was just reminded again as I was hearing Constance speak just how lucky we are to be survivors um, mm -hmm. and to be able to carry the torch um, and be in community with others who are battling and are surviving and are finding freedom. So thanks, right. guys. thank you guys so much. Thanks, Constance. And goodbye, everyone. We'll see you next week right back here on our Facebook page. All right. Have a nice night. Ciao.